Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be trying to answer a question about that I received on the last video on uh, Fuchsia from one of my viewers that asked, "Well, what's a current? What's what's a what's a, an example of a of a 21st century operating system instead of Fuchsia?" I think that deserves a longer answer than I could do in a comment, and so this video is an attempt to do that. Stick around right after this. So, uh, <laughs> instead of trying to describe, there aren't many, I mean, to be honest, there, I mean, there aren't any, <laughs> there's a lot of research operating systems that are around, but the problem that you have with operating systems is, is that they're mostly, they come up, there's some ideas that people have for research. They'll publish some papers and then they just kind of let it die. Uh, you can go out, there's all kinds of operating systems that have been used in academics from uh, MIT to ETH to Berkeley to University of Illinois. There's just tons of them, but they never go anywhere. Why don't they ever go anywhere? It's the same old adage. It's the killer app that drives the need for an operating system. But I think we're really past that at this point. And so what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about what happened in the last century, the 20th century, and then where do I see some needs for improvement? Uh, and so basically what we're going to do here is we're going to design one. <laughs> That's what I would attempt to do anyway. So, um, so what changed since the 20th century? I, I guess uh, from a high level, I, I guess there's really a bunch of stuff that has really happened. I mean, the transition during my lifetime went from batch processing to interactive processing. Instead of uh, instead of using punch cards and paper tape and all that garbage, and then scheduling jobs to run in a you know in a sequence in order to accomplish a task. I mean, computers were, back then didn't do much more than just compute, right? So. I mean, they calculated numbers and they added stuff together and then they produced some kind of printout that said, here, here's your payroll report for the month and here's your, here's where, here's your list of sales for the month and that kind of thing. And that was all done in batch. Interactive programming is I didn't want to wait for somebody to, to run off a piece of paper, but by the time I got it, the data was so old it was useless to me anyway. I wanted to be able to look it up myself, and so that was one of the big changes that occurred. The uh, second one, it was the emergence of the microprocessor and single-purpose boxes, and we're talking about appliances here. So in the old days, the, the, the processors were, they would fill a room. <laughs> they were probably taller than me, seven to eight feet tall in a lot of cases. Um, and they had, the processor boards would have been anywhere from 25 to 100 uh, in there. And those uh, machines are quite expensive. Most of them weighed a lot. I remember having to cut a hole in the roof of a building and lowering the machine in by crane because uh, there was just no physical way to get it up to the stairs. Their, their IT department was on the fourth floor. And so we had to physically cut a hole in the roof and they put a skylight in so that when they wanted to remove the computer, they could lift it back out with a crane. Uh, yeah, far cry from the forklift upgrade that everybody talks about today. <laughs> that, was a, that was a crane upgrade. Uh, the other one is that networking and distributed systems is is more ubiquitous. Uh, there were some applications that did some limited distributed uh, computing back in the 60s, but the networking technology at that time was pretty primitive. Uh, but today, I mean, we rely on the network and distributed computing for everything. So if the, yeah, I mean, that's just the way things are. Open source software has certainly had a huge impact in the change. Uh, that has come about, and that change, I think, is mostly for the good. Uh, time sharing versus real-time OS. So the if you look at the kind of the evolution of operating system designs going from the 40s up through the 50s and, at the, and toward the end of the 50s, you would have seen this shift. And there's there's a really good book that, that's about, uh, uh, about Lick Litter, and his progression through the technology, there was a lot of scientists back in the in the 40s that had a lot to do. And a lot of those guys went on all the way up into the 90s that had a huge impact on the shape that computing took. They were not satisfied with just having machines that they could submit jobs to. They wanted to have, uh, they didn't want to wire boards. They wanted to be able to use programming that was reusable. 
They wanted to be able to uh, share that environment with multiple users. And so time sharing was the thing that came up as an operating system improvement. Before that, the operating systems were nothing more than just an executive that would start up the card reader or the paper tape reader and start processing the job uh, and reading data in and then producing some print result or some paper tape output or something like that. Or maybe go as a tape. Disk drives came in later, but you know, that, yeah, but time sharing has it was a big thing in the in the '60s and '70s, but you know by the time that workstations started to enter the market, now if you look back at what Xerox Park did, um, and introducing the workstation as a standalone machine to be able to allow people to have their own environment to do their own kind of thing then you started getting away from time sharing because you didn't really need that anymore. What you needed was an ability to share data. And so the real-time OS came about uh, in order to replace time sharing. Of course, it never did. Here we are in the 21st century, and we're still using time sharing operating systems to do most of our work, which are really totally ill-suited to that task. The, the, the founders of the computing industry wanted to get rid of time sharing, <laughs> they, which is re, re, one of the reasons why they introduced real-time OSs. So anyway, just, just a bit of history there. Uh, hardware also, there were huge improvements in CPU, RAM, and storage. But they, um, I, was looking, I was looking back at some of the data that I had collected over the years and I remember that the CPU memory, so there, there was a cycle time between getting data from memory into the CPU and then processing the data, and then there was a cycle time to write it back out. And I, and I remember recording uh, that the CPU cycle time for memory transfers was about four to seven cycles, depending upon whether you were reading or writing it to memory. Today, that could be several thousand cycles uh, so memory has not really kept up too well with the performance of the CPUs. And I think you all know that, especially if you're a gamer, you probably know that pretty well, that it just has not been able to keep up very well. And RAM is still one of the big latency problems that we have, and there's a lot of different solutions that people are trying in order to mitigate some of that. Cache memories have, have come into play, which are expensive. Very high speed memory that is a part of the CPU that's trying to overcome of that, some of that. But then you run into the issue of how do I clean out the cache? How do I refresh the cache? What happens when the job goes away? How long do I keep it to make sure that you know somebody doesn't restart it or something? But and then storage, of course, has always been slow. I mean, <laughs> you think a thousand cycles is a long time, um, but so the other one is uh, runtime and direction became more expensive. Uh, and so I probably will go into more of that later. I don't really want to cover that right now. That's a pretty large topic. But as we started adding threads to the system, the thread context switches became very expensive. They are very slow. And some of those can take upwards of 10,000 cycles to complete. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a machine that's running at 4 gigahertz, you're probably not going to really notice it. It's probably one millisecond. But still, that is a lot of time. That is a huge amount of time wasted just to do a threads context switch. NUMA came around, and that helped improve things in order to allow us to be able to more efficiently utilize multiple processors in the machines. Uh, interrupt improvements, uh, as far as, I mean, everything as far as Intel is, it, architecture is concerned is interrupt driven. Uh, it wasn't always so with CPUs. Uh, there were some of them that were message driven and uh, there was a lot of them that used direct memory access. Now, you can couple interrupts with DMA, and, and there are some advantages, of course, in doing that. Uh, and But <clears throat> the really big performance improvements to the operating system has been in longer pipelines and branch predictors. And I, I'm going to stop and just tell you a story here. So I was working for Burroughs at the time, and I was uh, out doing some Q&A for one of the plants in the small systems uh, division was thinking about actually taking a job with them at, at the time and I was talking to the hardware designer and he was telling me that the hardware is getting slower and slower and I was like huh how can that be I thought I thought you were putting more you're packing more transistor transistors onto the uh, packages now and he said the problem is that's not it I mean 
the the issue is is the complexity of the circuits is getting to the point where in order to manage that many transistors that it was taking longer and longer to accomplish the individual cycles of the instructions and the improvements were coming from software and the operating system in order to utilize it more efficiently and so yeah <laughs> uh and, and it was due to pipelines i mean the back then i think the longest pipelines i remember seeing now pipelining is how you uh, allow the machine to do multiple, uh, and a, it's a fetch an instruction, decode the instruction, execute the instruction, and store. Those are those are typically the four types of activities that a CPU does. The number of pipelines is is what allows you to do multiples of those things at once. So you have multiple different things that are happening, with, and it could be multiple applications. It could be the same application, but. It, Today, you're looking at pipelines in excess of 12 to 18. There's even some that are 24 to 30. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, that has gotten, that's where the, most of the improvements have come from. And as we saw a couple of years ago, that was one of the, also one of the areas where some of the vulnerabilities and security showed up. So, yeah, because uh, maybe they took a little a few shortcuts to get it done. Uh, software static analysis was always the case uh, back in the 20th century, and I mean by that is you had to you had to snapshot the application, dump it, and then go and look at the the, the dump. Now, I remember, and this again is working for Burroughs on the small system, that didn't work so good, uh, and the the problem was is that the machine didn't halt when you told it to because it was working through the pipeline and it wouldn't shut down until the pipeline was done. So if you were looking at a trace where you would find the error in your application, would it be 4,000 instructions back for where it stopped? So yeah, static analysis was not too easy to do. Anyway, the public crypto keys and uh, key, public key infrastructure came about in the 70s and the 80s so yeah so that was a pretty big change in software for the first time even though the hardware wasn't really able to support it very well it was pretty slow uh it those kinds of things allowed us for the first time to be able to encrypt the data and protect it that way shared nothing message passing uh that's been around a long time but unfortunately we still haven't really used it very efficiently uh, message passing means that you know the problem you have with shared memory is that you have to protect it from somebody else writing over it. So you have these blocks and locks, and if you go back to my explanation of how IPC works in one of my previous videos, you'll find out more about that. But there is a such a thing called a shared nothing, which basically means I am sending messages directly to the recipient that I need to send it to, and I'm not sharing that data with anyone else. It is going point to point uh, in, the, uh, in the system. Also, asynchronous programming, that opened up a huge performance increase uh, and then finally we talk about monolithic kernels versus microkernels we talked a little bit about that uh, during the fuchsia reviews monolithic kernels being like linux where everything sits in, in a block of memory so you know, all your device drivers all of your all of the things that the operating system needs the scheduler the networking the ipc the memory access all of that stuff sits in memory whereas a microkernel only drags in those things that it needs now if you look at the two pieces of code on 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 disk, a micro uh, a kernel is going to be larger than a monolithic kernel, and because you have handling that has to occur there that the monolithic kernel doesn't have to do. But during the runtime, typically the, the micro kernel occupies a much smaller space. And my kind of experience playing around with Fuchsia OS a little bit, I noticed that it is really lightweight. I mean, it is small. That footprint of that OS is tiny compared to Linux. So it doesn't drag everything in and then it throws stuff out when it doesn't need it anymore. So uh, so where do I kind of see, now I'm borrowing some of this uh, from industry literature, uh, so this isn't all mine, but some of the, some of the uh, antidotes in here are mine. So the choices in deployment versus development. So what this means is, is that a lot of times the developers will spend a lot of time building in all these features into the application. So for example, if I have an application that needs to support Ceph, for example, then I might optimize my application to use Ceph. Uh, and the same thing happens with 
the an application that's used in Gluster, for example, I might put optimizations into the code in order to use Gluster more efficiently. Sorry about that. So, if so, an example is let's say that I have an application that in one instance is running on an, on on a system that doesn't have Ceph or Gluster. I want to be able to turn those elements of the application off. I don't need those. So during instead of having it baked into the development, maybe I put in some configuration switches into the deployment that says, oh, turn this off and don't use that code. I don't need it here. So it, yeah, it's just allowing the system ends, the functionality to build in and add in the libraries that are needed to support, and yet the application will continue to function even if those particular libraries aren't there and aren't present. This prevents me from having to go and create multiple uh, copies of the application depending upon the environment that it's in. So yeah, I know that's not gonna be easy to do on Linux. Yeah, I understand that, so don't don't you don't have to send me a comment. I know that's really hard, but uh, yeah, it's because the current operating systems don't have that functionality built in. I know that. <laughs> so um, the other thing, I, I the other thing that a lot of people talk about is being able to share the same app and driver code from low to high end. Now, what I'm talking about here is the ability to run the same driver base and application base on a wide range of processors. And you probably think, wow, you must be smoking crack. You're never going to get that to work. ARM processors and and Intel processors, they don't run the same. You're right, they don't. But the Look back at if you go read some literature on when AT and T originally announced ELF, uh, that is the executable linkable format. And by the way, that uh, that is the same format that Linux uses today. You will see in there support for cross-platform. It is already in that in that particular environment. Do we use it? No. I mean, if you try to run an x86 uh, based machine on Linux. Uh, on an ARM-based processor, it fails. This is like, can't open it. I don't know what to do with this. But if there was cross, cross-platform support in it, the code would jump to that particular part in the code that was ARM. Just saying. And that support was in there. I don't know if it still is, but I know that was one of the intentions of it. At the time, there was so many different processors that Unix supported, they were looking for a single file format to be able to support them all. Let's talk a little bit about fault tolerance. So most fault tolerance systems support comes from third parties. So I know that what we're talking about here is the kind of fault tolerance that you would find if the machine itself failed, application went down, I might try to restart it, or I might say, well, there's something wrong with this machine, I'm just gonna push that app over to another box and run it there, and then transfer the workloads over to it. Uh, now, in VMs, a lot of that is done within the, the virtual machine operating environment. But you have to add, put on add-ons for that in order for that to work, like VMware has that ability to do that. And the same is true of scaling. So as the application scales up, if you're running Kubernetes, it can monitor and see that, hey, these applications aren't performing to what my SLA is is requiring so I can add additional machine resources in order to balance the load out across more resources. Uh, and also you use load balancing in a web server. And a lot of that is not static. A lot of that you have to do that kind of manually. It depends on how many web servers you have to do that. But there are ways that you can, with third party apps, you can have that automatically scale up using cloud-based software and then scale back down when you're done. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it should include that scaling across multiple machines, not just within the same machine. Improved security. Um, there's been some things to do to protect the system from suspect apps. I mean, we have jails and, uh, and we have containers and we are trying to prevent the application from being able to see the environment around it and then gain a foothold into the system. Uh, but... It, it's kind of a cost benefit analysis and so security is is still pretty bad I mean that is still an area that really needs a lot of work uh, and I think that maybe the, the operating system should look at it as risk analysis so that I can configure in what what level of risk I want for this particular set of applications on this particular machine and then have the security modes come up around it rather than trying to second guess. Uh, one of the quotes I've heard, I don't remember where I heard this, but it, 
if you're trying to protect $100,000 worth of data, well, maybe you ought to use a security system that's proportionately, that the cost of that security system is proportional to the amount of the, the cost of the data you're trying to protect. If you spend a million dollars to protect 100000 that just makes no sense at all. Uh, and uh, and that's another reason that you would want to have something configured into the deployment to say, okay, for this application, this data is absolutely critical. It absolutely is no cost. Uh, no, if we don't care what the cost is, this has to be protected. Uh, you know, otherwise the CEO goes to jail or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's that kind of things that I think that needs to be built into the operating system in order to configure at the time I deploy the system. I mean, I look at how much time I spend on doing hardening here. It's ridiculous. Uh, is every There are so many settings you have to worry about. To me, this is just crazy. This is just crazy. Finally, performance improvements. And again, this goes back to experience. Uh, one of the things I remember in the 90s what we were trying to get rid of was time-sharing operating systems and trying to get over to real-time OSs. <clears throat> A lot of people seem to have a misconception that real-time OSs mean that that's only for HPC or for embedded devices, but it, it's that is just a misconception. Time sharing means that uh, now in the traditional sense, it meant that I was going to allocate a specific amount of clock time to the application to run. At the end of that clock cycle, I was going to stop the program, throw it out and grab something else, put it in there, let it run for a while and and move on so yeah it would you'd run this application for this long and then quit grab this application run it for this long and quit but that's not flexible enough because there's some applications that need more time than that there's some applications that need less time than that and in anyway it might be waiting on disk but you're still waiting for the clock timer to clock to come down before you reclaim that that particular resource to allow something to run not a very efficient thing. And and, and the designers of, of the original time-sharing operating systems, they knew that. But they were, you know, these were only single CPU machines, and so it didn't really matter. I mean, uh, it wasn't like you had somewhere else you could run the job. So, and 30 years later, here we are. I mean, even after all the talk in the 90s about getting rid of them, here we are, we're still using them. Uh that's crazy. It just amazes me that we're still using these things. Uh, but the design of the OS needs to be for the type of environments that we're programming for. And we're in an interactive environment where we have applications coming and going, requests going from one application to another. We might have database access, database access requests that are going out over the network to the database server. We might have middleware apps that are maybe queuing or scheduling or doing some background things that are necessary in order to build, take the business logic and process the data before placing it into the database or, or whatnot. So it really needs to be event-driven. That's the way you would read that, event-driven, because the time-sharing model is too inefficient. So anyway, that, that's just an example of some of the things that I would include in a modern OS. Do I have an example of one? No. <laughs> There's a... Uh, yeah, Fuchsia does it, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people are nervous about Google being the author of it. Uh, you know, there is uh, I, one of the one of my viewers pointed out that there's a, a Dahlia OS, which is based on Fuchsia, uh, but it uses uh, a lot of just open source code to put it together, and they are also using Flutter as the uh, mechanism for the UI. I played around with it a little bit. It looks like it's kind of early in the beta cycle. So I would I would review it, but I, I really don't want to, to push something into the limelight that is at that stage. It it is I would I would not even say it's beta. I, there's there's features that are still missing in the application base around the OS. Um but it looks it, it's very small. I I can tell you that. The it's very lightweight. Um so keep an eye on that one. That looks like an interesting OS um, as far as the features that it's offering, and you don't have Google behind it. So that might be something else that you might take a look at. So anyway, that's uh, that's all I had for today. Uh, I'm going to do a follow-up to this and, and maybe start delving into a little bit more architecture of what, how these features would come together and do things. But... Um, 
designing an OS, I mean, like I said, there are a lot of OSs that are around that, that do some of these functions, and um, Linux, unfortunately, is not one of them. Yes, there is a real-time kernel for Linux, uh, and you can deploy it. Um, you can even turn on the real-time uh, scheduler inside of your existing kernel. If you have the source code, you can just go in and, and shut down the time-sharing one and turn on the RTS. But I'm not sure, uh, RTOS, I mean, I'm not sure how well Linux will really handle it because it is really built around the signals approach to, to sending messages to the kernel, kicking off things and scheduling things to read and write from disk and all of that stuff that goes through the normal device driver paths and then pops out with an answer into the user space for the application to pick up. Uh, a lot of, I have seen a lot of designs based on IPC. IPC isn't the most efficient thing either because it's shared and requires protection when applications are attempting to write. You don't want your shared memory to be written over before the other application has had a chance to read it, for example. So, yeah, there's a lot of locking that goes on and blocking of that particular memory space while it's being written to in order to protect it from app other applications that might write over the data that's there. Uh, you can easily get into race conditions and there's just it's just a headache. So that's why the shared nothing approach kind of came about. <clears throat> I was looking back at uh, some of the things in Mach. And now Mach was a event-based kernel, but Linux, the, I should say the, the GNU Foundation attempted to add that kind of capability to herd and of course, that, as we know, is a failure. That did not work out too well. And so they adopted to just move to a straight uh, Linux kernel and go from there. But Mach, is, it was successful. And of course, it's defunct now, uh, other than the implementation of Mach that's in the Mac OS. So yeah, you still have Mach that's being used there. But, but was it, you know, the whole thing about Apple is kind of weird to me because in the early days of Mac OS, they actually had a message-driven operating system that, that didn't rely on on a, on a on a Unix kernel. It wasn't until Jobs came back from Next OS that he put all that stuff into the Mac. But if you look at how the original Mac OS ran, that was all message-based. Now, it wasn't really set up to do uh, any of the modern parallelism tasks like asynchronous and any of that kind of stuff. But it really did have a message passing OS in it at that time. So yeah, there's just there's been a lot of things that have kind of changed and you kind of scratch your head and go, why? Why <laughs> why did we do this? But anyway, that's that's all I had for now. Hope you enjoyed this. And um, let me know in the comments some of your suggestions of what things you would like to see improved as well. Uh, we're always interested in trying to improve performance and we're always interested in, in increasing security, but unfortunately, those two work like this. If I increase security, I decrease performance. If I increase performance, I, I usually get rid of some of the security in order to do that. So they, they don't necessarily mesh very well together. You usually you sacrifice one over the other. But again, that's a, a, something that needs to be configured at the time you deploy, I think. I mean, that's just my opinion. But the, God, don't do it the way we're doing it now, where I have to go in and make 50, 50 to 100 adjustments in order to harden a kernel. That's just crazy. That's the way we're doing it. It's no wonder we have this mess. Is that if you miss a step, you've left open a vulnerability. So anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this. See you next time, and bye for now.